and good morning. I'm David from Arbor Grove United Methodist Church in Perlier, North Carolina. If you just stopped by or if you clicked here by accident, feel free to join in and worship with us for a few minutes. You may be heading to church later, or this may be your church for the day. And if that's the deal, well, then that's great. In any event, we're glad you came. And I hope that something shared here from the Word of God will be a blessing to you before your day's out. You know, the past two weeks, we've been studying and thinking about something that all folks think about from time to time, particularly those that read God's Word. And some people get plumb obsessed with it occasionally, particularly in times like the, the virus and uh, when world events are getting kind of shaky. And the subject that they think about a lot is the end of time. They wonder, is this the end of time? When's the end of time coming? Everybody's worried about the end of time. You know, even Jesus' closest followers, the disciples, wondered about it. And Jesus gave them and consequently us all the information that we need to know about it concerning our walk with him. Many scriptures refer to it, and the book of Revelation is dedicated to it. But Jesus reduced it to a simple set of statements in Matthew chapter 24, and that's what we've been uh, studying in the last couple of weeks, and we'll finish up with today, hopefully. You know, last week, Jesus started giving the disciples a set of conditions that would signal a great tribulation for their future and for our future. And that picture doesn't start out real pretty either, I'll tell you. The first thing he talked about was there was going to be an abomination of abomination of desolation. Say that three times and see how hard it is. That there be some sort of anti-God or anti-Christ that's going to set up shop right in the temple area of Jerusalem. The second thing he talked about was there was going to be a time of fleeing from Jerusalem, the holy city. Something so terrible was going to take place there that God's people will try to leave the area and hide in various places. He also talked about a tribulation coming right after that time like the world has never seen before. Now, our old world's seen some pretty bad stuff, particularly uh, by the time our generation has come around. But Christ said this is going to be worse than anything that's happened so far. He said there would be a time of false Christs, false saviors, false teaching, and even with great signs accompanying them that could deceive even his strongest believers. He said there was going to be a time coming that if God didn't intervene, there'd be no human beings alive left on the planet Earth. And he said that there would be war and there would be pestilence and there would be famine and great natural disasters that would kill thousands, perhaps millions of people. Now, you know, we've seen some of that stuff in history, even in our day. But a lot of these things we've brought on ourselves. And even just this week, we've been remembering what human beings are capable of doing to other human beings when we have remembered the events of 9-11 and what happened at the World Trade Center. But did these type things take place in the disciples' time? Well, yeah, some of them. But they have still been taking place for the 2,000 years since that time as well, and they have been getting worse and more lethal all the time. And the, the end has not been yet. So we're going to take God's word and we're going to pick up where we left off last week and see where this goes. In verse 29 of Matthew chapter 24, if you're following along in the Bible, Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Now, if something darkens the sun, and the moonlight. Chances are that whatever that is, is going to be seen worldwide. It could be a nuclear exchange. It could be an invasive asteroid impacting Earth. It could be something that we don't even know about yet. But God says, through Jesus, that it's going to shake the heavens, whatever it is. That's going to get our attention. And then, in verse 30, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and 
Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and with great glory. In other words, this sign's going to appear what it is. We don't know right now, but we will see it, and the whole world's going to see it. And because of this sign, the whole world will see the Son of Man, Jesus, coming in the clouds. That's what I gather out of this verse anyway. So think about this. What will your reaction be if you're standing here? Will it be excitement? Hey, Jesus is coming back. Will it be joy? Oh, praise God, the Savior's here. Or will it be gut-wrenching fright at Christ coming and finding you doing all sorts of what? What will you be doing? His will or Satan's will? Verse 30 says, all the tribes of the earth will mourn. There's going to be a lot of guilt going to take place that moment that Christ comes back. Where will you be in the crowd? Verse 31 says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, trumpets can make a big racket. I play in jazz band a couple of nights a month, uh, a swing band. That just I, I love doing it. I love that old style music. And we've got three trumpet players usually, and I'm telling you, they can raise a ruckus when they all get a good wind and, and start playing. It's pretty loud. But this is going to be a sound that you can hear worldwide because everybody's going to see it. Everybody's going to hear it. And his angels, it says, shall gather together his elect. There's that word elect again. We talked about it last week. Who are the elect? Well, those who God knows that love him are elect. And not necessarily the sinless either, because none of us are sinless. But those who are forgiven of their sin. Those who have repented of their sin. Those who have cast their hope of salvation on his promise of forgiveness. Because of their faith and because of God's grace. Those are God's elect among some others. Verse 32 says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. This is Jesus talking now. Learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Well, now we can read the signs like that. We know when, when leaves are falling off it's and turning colors, it's probably autumn here in the south. And uh, we know when they're putting out new shoots and stuff that it's springtime. We know when they're gone, it's wintertime. Uh... But these are signs. He doesn't give us a date, but he gives us signs. Verse 33, so likewise ye, when you see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. These signs tell us when the end is near. And they're a warning to us. They're a sign of things to come. Verse 34 says, verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. There's a generation to go whenever these things come down. And we don't know which generation this is. These things have happened a lot in 2,000 years, but it might be our generation. We don't know, but we're warned about what to do. Verse 35 says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus uttered these words. Have they passed away? No. God's words uttered that we have recorded in the Bible uh, centuries and centuries and millennia before that. Have they passed away? No, we've still got them. We still print them. We still read them. We still pray about them. So the ground under your feet isn't permanent. Just ask somebody that suffers through the earthquakes like we had here a couple of weeks ago. The heavens above are not permanent because God's word says they're going to melt with fervent heat. But God's word and God's promises and God's judgment, that is permanent. It's forever. So as to what's going to happen, which the disciples were asking, and when it's going to happen, well, we know what's going to happen. But the when part, no man knows. Jesus said he didn't even know. Only God the Father, not even Jesus himself. But it'll be just like it was before the flood. See if this describes our day right now. Go to verse 37. 
But as in the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until that day when Noah entered into the ark. Does that sound like us today? Well, sure it does. I'm a living example that the eating's taking place. People are getting married. People are sick. They're uh, raising kids. Everything that happens in humanity is happening today. People are just going on about their lives and their work. And even in the middle of the pandemic, people are trying to find some kind of normalcy. But Jesus said that it's going to be like it was till Noah went into the ark and they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Then, and here's where it starts getting down to the nitty gritty. See where you fit in with these verses. Then two shall be in the field. One taken, the other left. Where are they going to be taken? Well, I don't know, but Jesus, Jesus' angels are coming and going to take his elect. I bet the elect is one of the one that got taken. I bet the one that's left is going to be left here in the tribulation. What do you think? Verse 40 says there shall be two in the field. Uh, excuse me, verse 41. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken, the other left. Which one do you want to be? Verse 42 then finally says, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour that your Lord doth come. We're supposed to watch. We're supposed to watch. You know, we know the times and the seasons. He tells us the signs. What does Jesus say we're supposed to do? Look at verse 42 again. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye ready. He's talking to us. Be ye ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? And we'll close with this verse of Scripture. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. What are you going to be found doing. We're supposed to watch and be about what God would have us do until the appointed time. Make sure that you're numbered with the elect. That's the ones that are going to be taken out of this mess. How do you do that? You put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as God's only begotten son. You repent of your sin. You accept his sacrifice as the price of your salvation. Galatians 3 there's uh, three little verses down here, four verses, that I want to read to you out of Galatians chapter 3. It starts at verse 26. Again, who are the elect? Who will be taken out of this mess? Well, he says for us to be the elect, he says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free. There is neither male or female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then ye are Abraham's seed, all the way back to Abraham's time here, and heirs according to the promise. We've been grafted into the tree, folks. We've been grafted in. We're heirs right along with the elect that God chose as his chosen children. So we need to get busy doing the two things he told us to do. And we need to do this in the midst of coronavirus, in the middle of a war, in the middle of our own temptations, as terrible as they can be, whatever your temptations are, in the middle of your pains and your worst fears. Love, he told us two things to do, love God with all your heart and love your neighbors as you love yourself. That's what he wants to find us doing when he comes back. Use that for your measuring stick. Use those two guides for all that you do. You won't do it perfectly, but your heart will be in the right place. And you will be blessed and you will endure and you will be saved when he comes, whether that's sooner or later. Amen. Here's an old song that kind of gets in a hurry, as Lester Flatt used to say. If you've come to the Lord, you're going to be happy about it. A lot of folks came in the old times. We think about old time religion. 
religion of our grandpas and our ancestors. It still works today. You go like this right here. I think you'll like it. I'm glad Jesus came. Glory to his name. Oh, what a friend is he. He so freely gave his own life to save from bonds of sin set free. I've got that old time religion in my heart, way down inside. I've got that new kind of feeling in my heart, joys of life. Nobody knows what it means to me. Nobody be born again. I've got that old time religion in my heart, way down inside. I've got that new kind of feeling in my heart, joys of Nobody knows what it means to me. Nobody knows but my Lord and me. I've got God bless you. Don't forget to read your Bible. I hope to see you next week.